If you listen to the Shaping Fire show pretty often, chances are that you're at least somewhat familiar with the soil food web. That is the term now used pretty universally to describe the transfer of energy between species in the ecosystem of soil. We're talking about all the plants, bacteria, fungi, microbes, protozoa, nematodes, and arthropods, and then birds and other animals. They exist from the tiny guys deep in the soil all the way up to where the soil stops and our feet start. Those of us who study and create living soil have become pretty familiar with the soil food web by learning from thought leaders like Dr. Elaine Ingham and Jeff Lowenfels and other folks. It's actually one of my favorite things to even think about. Imagine my astonishment when I learned that there was another food web, mirroring the one that we have for soil, but taking place in water. Of course, in retrospect, that there would be a water food web is pretty obvious, but I had never given it much thought, and the idea that there was a twin to my favorite topic of living soil made me very, very happy. The water food web consists of phytoplankton, algae, zooplankton, small fish, crustaceans, and all the way up to bigger fish and corals and eventually whales. The water food web describes how all of these life forms exchange energy and compete and form a complex web similar in many ways to the ones that we know for living soil. And it's totally badass. If you want to learn about cannabis health, business, and technique efficiently and with good cheer, I encourage you to subscribe to our newsletter. We'll send you a new podcast episode as it comes out, delivered right to your inbox, along with commentary on a couple of the most important news items for the week and videos too. Don't rely on social media to let you know when a new episode is published. Sign up for the updates to make sure you don't miss an episode. Also, we're giving away very cool prizes to folks who are signed up to receive the newsletter. This is the last week to sign up for the newsletter to win one of the five prize packs of the new endomycorrhizal inoculant from Dynamike. There's nothing else you need to do to win except receive that newsletter. So go to shapingfire.com to sign up for the newsletter and be entered into this month's and all future newsletter prize drawings. You are listening to Shaping Fire, and I'm your host, Shango Los. Today, my guest is cannabis aquaponics expert, Steve Raisner. Steve designs and builds commercial-scale aquaponic systems. He builds them for lots of different purposes, but he especially enjoys building them for cannabis. Steve is a sought-after speaker on the range of cannabis growing topics and shares his knowledge via his Potent Ponics podcast and in person through classes he hosts. He's also built a very educational YouTube channel, also called Potent Ponics, with a range of content from instructional videos to Google Hangouts with topic experts. Today, we're going to talk about the water food web. Welcome to the show, Steve. Thanks for having me, Shango. Yeah, so glad that you could uh, peel off a little of your time there in Oklahoma off your project to to chat with us. So let's get right into it. And, you know, um, aquaponics and the water food web, um, while it is the center of your world, and certainly it's increasing in popularity, I think that it's kind of on the fringe of most cannabis people's experience. And so um, let's start off by giving people like a context about what we're even going to be talking about today. So, um, you know, talking about it at a, at a global level, if we were talking about the, 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 the water food web, we would be talking about salt water and fresh water and estuaries and, and everything from phytoplankton all the way up to whales and things like that. But, but today I, I'm figuring that it's probably better for us to talk about the water food web as it applies to aquaponics, your specialty. So, so let's start with this word aquaponics. Um, the words aquaponics, hydroponics, and aquaculture are, are thrown around and I think incorrectly used synonymously back and forth. Um, would you kind of like give us some depth on how to use these words and what we're actually going to be talking about today? Sure. So um, I guess traditionally aquaculture would be the growing and, and um, raising of fish for the mainly food purposes, but sometimes other utility purposes. Um, they also use them for skin grafts and um, even filtering wines and beers. Uh, they use fish bladders and things like that. Um, and then you also use, um, so for hydroponics, you know, everyone's pretty familiar with hydroponics, listens to your show, using mineralized salts uh, you know, in a, an aquatic environment and just delivering a non-soil or soilless environment traditionally, uh, most of the time, but not all the time, and hydroponics are doing so in a sterile or as sterile as possible um, aquatic environment. And then you have aquaponics where we use uh, fish and fish waste similar uh, from an aquaculture system to raise fish in a hydroponic system. 
um, although they are different chemically um, it, than traditional hydroponics in many different ways um, because of the mineralization process and how much more we rely on a much wider range of microbes than they would in a hydroponic system. Sometimes ones that can cause problems in a hydroponic system actually are very beneficial in an aquaponic system if they're maintained in proper population levels, um, you know, in, in the right balance. So, so, t- so saying that a different way, hydroponics is going to be more kind of, you know, bottled salt based A plus B kind of stuff, which may not be organic natural, but they get the job done feeding the plants to a degree. Aquaponics is going to be way more analog, chunky, organic, natural, which is great for the plants. But if you tried to use those solutions in hydroponics, all your sprayers would get clogged with nature, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So things like um, really fine sprayers, you know, fine water lines, all of them would clog with bacterial mats and and other issues that, um, you know, anyone that's run those, even without biologics has run into those, those issues as well. (laughs) So, so from listening to you speak before, um, I've heard you talk about the split biome and that's probably a really great place for us to start because when I first started doing my research for this interview today, I actually thought that that aquaponics had the cannabis plant bare root in, you know, like in my head was essentially an aquarium. So it was like the roots dangling in water. And I'm all like, how, how do they, how do they breathe? You know, because when it comes to soil, we don't want to overwater because it'll choke out the plant. And I'm like, I don't know how these, how these roots are going to live in water. But then, but then, you know, I hear you say split biome and I'm like, oh, wait a minute. It's both water and either a soil or maybe an inert substrate. So so would you describe that and kind of explain the idea behind it? Sure. So what you were first describing is what is referred to as DWC or deep water culture, which is bare root and water. And um, we, we, there's a lot of people that have done tests in the past, different aquaponics companies, and the, it simply doesn't allow um, the, the proper flower structure and proper plant structure and, and node density as well as a few other issues um, with the plants. So we use a method called dual root zone planting where we have pots where they have the top half is soil and a layer of burlap and the bottom half is either lava rock or hydrogen. And this allows us to have terrestrial microbes, mycorrhizae, um, and, uh, et cetera, and different, you know, terrestrial microbes that all of you guys have, you know, familiar with from from soil and the soil food web. And I'm sure you've had other amazing guests on uh, talking about that. And then we have the aquatic microbiome, where we have all these aquatic microbes that can mineralize all these different nutrients in their own way, sim- very similarly to the ones in soil, but they do so in radically different ways chemically. And what this allows us to do is, is uh, stimulate the immune system of the plant in a way that is, is radically um, uh, broader than uh, just a soil or just an aquatic environment. Um, there was a study done by NASA a few years ago where NASA was trying to do a broad microbial study of aquatic microbes and terrestrial microbes so they could figure out, okay, well, if we go off world, what microbe groups do we need to bring with us? If we're going to grow a garden, you know, what do we need to bottle and bring with us to, to, to make food and, and crops and whatever else they need to grow? What they found was when they did the commercial aquaponics facilities around North America, they did over 50 of them. None of them had the same microbe webs uh, across any of them. I, I believe it was no more than 7% uh, similarities across microbes across all these different ones. <coughs> Sorry. So you have a, uh, uh, what that means is that, you know, you have radically different microbe species that are making iron available or silica available or nitrogen available or potassium or phosphorus, etc. And and none of them were the same, and all of them had kind of different processes for it. So it's just really cool that you have such biodiversity. Um, but what that means is that we can get increased terpene expression, increased cannabinoid expression in our plants, as well as accelerated growth rate um, is what that translates into and as far as bottom line for the grower. All right. There's a lot there to unpack. So uh, the, the first thing I want to unpack there is is um, where the path is for the roots. So if if we've got the cannabis plant um, planted in soil, and so we are getting a more you know traditional what we think about as the as the the rhizosphere and living soil, and the plant is growing down through that, 
and then and then we'll get to the burlap bit in a minute and then rocks so so to a certain degree this sounds like building a traditional you know pot with the different horizons like you'd get in the earth's crust so i get that so at what point does the cannabis plant's roots hit the water are the roots going down to the water table so that the the ends of the roots are hitting this this specialty aquaponic water with fish in it or is this just a regular pot that's being watered from the top with water from an exterior tank so, so you it'll, after day three or four, uh, once we transplant them into that soil layer, the the plant finds that aquatic layer, and it'll have a noticeable increase in the speed of growth. Um, the plants really seem to use the nitrates better you know, and much faster than the night, you know, typical ammonia in the soil, and that really uh, helps with ex growth, accelerated growth, as well as the additional air exposure because those roots are flood and drain. They have much more air exposure, uh, and between the air and the and the different form of nitrogen, it really accelerates that growth rate. So um, they grow straight through that burlap and into the water so that the plant has both a network in the soil and in the water. And when I was back working um, at the aquaponics source a long time ago where I used to work in the lab, uh, we did all kinds of experiments and we found the woodier the crop in, in aquaponics, the more it relies on mycorrhizal fungi um, and the more lignin it has, I guess, to boil it down as a general rule of thumb. Again, not definitive, but as a general rule of thumb in aquaponics, um, you need a deeper soil layer uh, for the woodier the crop. So if I was doing fruit trees or something I was going to do indefinitely, maybe I would do more of a two-third soil to one-third of flood and drain. Um, whereas with cannabis plants, we're going to do about a 50-50 um, uh, instead. Do uh, Should people resist the temptation to have a, a drip irrigation with aquaponic water from the top because we want to encourage the cannabis roots to um, explore the deeper aquaponic layer downwards and because we want to encourage them to to expand Sure. So we actually top water all the all of our soil layer. Mm -hmm. uh, our flood and drain layer actually leaves about a half inch of wear um, be, be before the soil. We don't want it to touch or wick. Uh, and then we top water about twice a week. Um, uh, and that you absolutely you could use an automated system. We have for our larger systems we use a completely automated um, uh, array. I've actually designed in my own manifold that allows us to water. Uh, as many plants as we need to simultaneously within uh, about 10 milliliters difference across all the plants um, uh, simultaneously. So this way we don't have to worry about overwatering and having that water go through. So in a dual root zone, we're going to take our water and say it takes 16 ounces of water to fully saturate that upper soil layer, which we'll, we'll test before we put the pots in the bed. Um, with, with, you know, we'll just say for the sake of argument, we have an eight ounce party cup. Well, it takes two of those for me to uh, water for that water to drip through the soil and go out through the bottom. Uh, I'm going to reduce that amount by half. And in the future, if I need to top water, I'm only going to do this with eight ounces of water so that I'm not dosing so much that it's leaching out into the aquarium. And this allows me to, you know, maintain moisture levels in that upper layer between the humidity coming off the bottom of the, the, the bed and then the, the top watering. We can maintain, you know, pleasant moisture levels for the root system and do some minor feeding. The, the plant waste uh, or the, I'm sorry, the fish waste provides around 80 to 85 to 90 percent of the nutrients the plants need. And then we just amend that last 10 percent through the soil layer, either through minerals that we make in the initial soil uh, compost mix that we use for it or through uh, top feeding, depending on what it is that we need at a given time. When you are top watering, are you top watering with water from the aquaponics system or are you using, um, I, I don't know, terrestrial water, I guess I'll call it, you know, regular water? So we actually use water from the aquaponic system with one exception would be uh, the second half of flour, um, but in veg or certainly the first half of, of flour, we would absolutely use uh, system water. It's just a matter of in late flour, you're really trying to cut back on the nitrogen as much as possible. So we don't want to put any more on. So that'd probably be the only time that we don't use water from the um, system itself. Otherwise, we're just recirculating water from the system for our top feeding. We just pump it into a separate mineralization tank. 
uh, some water from our mineralization tanks, which we can talk about. Um, and uh, and then we also amend it. So if I have a, the pH is too low, we'll add potassium silicate or calcium carbonate or you know whatever pH up that we're going to use at the time uh, and amend it that way and before we add it back in. But this way we can add some mineral rich nutrients back into the system that all you know all come from the system. Awesome. Great explanation. So my second question on that is, you know, I live on an island, right? And one of the challenges that we've got is I live on an agricultural island and and, and people are constantly saying, don't put you know, don't over nitrogen, nitrogen, your, your fields, because when it runs off the Island, it goes into the Puget Sound and it causes, you know, uh, the too much algae and red tide and all this kind of stuff. I, I wondered, um, to what degree do you have to, for example, avoid using compost teas in these plants? Because as these nutrients go through the plant, they end up in your, aquarium your aquaponic layer and might throw off your balance there i mean are you only supposed to use the aquaponic or you know clean non-treated water or can can i go ahead and use compost teas and because it doesn't really matter oh no we use teas and ferments as part of our mineralization process we also use ferments as a way to uh, biocontrol for pathogens um we actually use lactobacillus ferments labs. I'm sure you've had many people on the show talk about the wonders of labs. Yeah. But one of the cool things of labs is in an aquatic environment is it'll eat E. coli, salmonella, listeria, and other things in a controlled lab environment. Um, that I can quote. I can't say it'll work 100% of the time in your farm legally, but I know for <laughs> a fact that in a laboratory it works on, um, and, and, you know, it works very well in practicality as well. So um, you can use these types of things not only to keep your system clean, but to eliminate pathogens and still use all those wonderful compost teas and ferments. Um, we're a bit real huge on um, uh, horsetail fern ferments. There's a great one. Um, we also use, we'll use occasionally fruit juice ferments as well um, uh, in flour for top feeding. So all the stuff that you guys have you know use already for your soil mixes. Um, absolutely can be used for uh, aquaponics and many of them actually have some radically additional benefits in aquaponics um, the one exception would be yucca extract and any kind of um, uh, wetting agents or uh, you know plant-based wetting agents uh, saponins and some other things like that those are all fish lethal so you always have to be careful just because it's organic doesn't mean it won't kill your fish right on yeah because it is while while it may not be you know, an organic toxin, it's going to throw off the balance enough that it's no longer a good living environment for the fish. Oh no, saponins are straight up fish lethal. The oh. uh, Indians and <laughs> the Indians in California used to, um, uh, or natives, I don't know, I guess that's the correct term now. Um, the natives in California, uh, used to collect uh, yucca root extract, uh, yucca root. They'd squeeze the juice out of it, concentrate it and evaporate it off, pour it into streams during the salmon run and collect the salmon and then dry them uh, and, and, you know, the saponin once it's cooked and everything is perfectly fine for humans, but it kills the fish in like, you know, parts per billion, uh, levels in a river. So, man, that's a mad science right there to know that so early on without an analytics lab. Yeah. With no chemistry knowledge or, you know, an idea of even what chemistry was, you know, to come up with that's pretty wild. So it really makes you, it's really neat, interesting sometimes to look at some of the ancient solutions. You know, um, some of the interesting stuff I've done with amino acid um, um, isolation actually came from like 16th and 17th century dye making techniques that I kind of adapted to make plant food and some other cool stuff. Um, so there's always, you know, really neat things sometimes going back in history and looking at how we used to do things, you know, is all, all, sometimes even better than looking forward. So, um, so what I'm hearing from you, I really thought that it was kind of like a zero sum game. You either did, you know, living soil growing or you did aquaponics growing. And it really sounds like aquaponics is, um, supercharged living soil growing because you're doing all of your, your regular living soil stuff that you would do to create this healthy, you know, rhizosphere in the upper layers. But then you're supercharging it with um, the water food web that we're going to talk more about in the second set as the roots reaches down to the aquaponic layer. Absolutely. Yeah. And it, again, it gives you benefits of, of both worlds. And you absolutely could do it just a soil and do it in a wicking bed. But um, with this, we get, you know, radically increase in speed of growth. We get radical increase in um, uh, speed of a bunch of different um 
uh, mineralization methods, and um, uh, we get a, a, a uh, a radical increase in disease resistance, a radical increase in, in terpene expression as well. Um, and, uh, you know, all those combined really makes a, a big difference. Right on. So let's go ahead and dive into that during set two and wrap up this one now. So we're going to take our first short re- break and be right back. You're listening to Shaping Fire. And my guest today is aquaponic cannabis expert, Steve Raisner. Living soil and regenerative cannabis agriculture are surging in popularity. And to implement these biological solutions, real science education is vital. If you are interested in all things probiotic growing, you will probably want to attend this year's Science of Organic Regenerative Cannabis Cultivation Conference. For the third year in a row, co-founders Joshua Rutherford of Dutch Blooms and Leighton Morrison of Kingdom Aquaponics have lined up an incredible array of educators with all new content for the traveling event. They're calling it version 2.0, going deeper down the rabbit hole. This year's teaching staff includes Elaine Ingham on soil biology, Chris Trump and Wendy Kornberg talking Korean natural farming, Kevin Jodry on cannabis genetics, Kelly and Josh from Dragonfly Earth Medicine, Suzanne Wainwright, the bug lady, Chip Osborne on soil chemistry, and many other thought leaders rotating in and out for different cities. So consult the website to know who specifically is coming for each location. There will be a breeding panel, a Q&A panel with the entire teaching staff, and on Saturday night, there will be a bubble hash discussion as well. Joshua has built in significant informal time for you with the teachers. The teaching staff is just as excited to work with you as you are about attending. There is also no advertising during the event. The only vendor booths are for cannabis seed breeders. Your tuition is what's paying the staff, so they will all be present and attentive to you, not a corporate sponsor. Even better, the conference is not just for folks on the West Coast. Humboldt, California is hosting one event for sure, but the show is going on the road to Vancouver, British Columbia, Portland, Maine, and Whitmore Lake, Michigan. Get out your pen now because I'm about to give you the website. This is a fabulous opportunity for you to hear from an array of nationally recognized top shelf soil educators all in one place. Not only that, this isn't just beginner stuff like you get at most conventions. This is an intensive for people like us who totally nerd out on the rhizosphere and growing in living soil. And if you attended last year, be assured that this year is not simply a repeat of last year. Every speaker will present different material than they did last year. The website is regenerativeorganiccannabis.com. That's regenerativeorganiccannabis.com. This year, tickets will be limited in number to preserve the intimate experience and will only be sold in advance online. There will be no ticket sales at the door. So don't wait and miss out on your chance to attend this important gathering of the regenerative cannabis community. Cut through all the misinformation out there and don't miss this opportunity to learn real soil science. RegenerativeOrganicCannabis.com This message is for folks who grow cannabis. I'm talking to home growers, patients, and commercial growers too. I'm probably talking to you. When you plan out your next growing cycle, be sure to check out Humboldt CSI Seeds at HumboldtCSI.com. Caleb Inspecta and his family have lived in Humboldt County for over 100 years. For the last 40 years, three generations of his family have cultivated extraordinary Sensamia cannabis in Humboldt, Mendocino, and Trinity Counties. Because of his lineage and the hard-earned experience that comes from growing up, smoking and sifting large populations of cannabis plants in Northern California, the seeds you'll cop from CSI will be winning genetics based on long-time heavy hitters and updated and resifted to bring out new and exotic traits and better yields. Go ahead and ask around. Caleb, also known as Inspecta and Pirates of the Emerald Triangle, is a breeder's breeder. He reaches way back and works with significant strains, recreating them in new and interesting ways that you'll love as a toker and a grower, as well as offering you some surprises that will delight serious seed traders and cultivators. Humboldt CSI goes a further step and selfs all these chemovars so you know all the seeds will be female. These are not experimental feminized seeds. Humboldt CSI releases some of the best female seeds available anywhere, and it will show in your garden. Folks grew quite a bit of CSI Humboldt Gen X last year here on Vashon Island, and everyone was pleased. The patients had beautiful female plants and didn't have to cull half of their garden as males. The folks growing for the fun of getting high grew colorful flowers with exceptional bag appeal and great highs. And breeders had seven out of seven females in a pack, which gave them a lot of phenotypic choices. 
Take a moment right now and visit HumboldtCSI.com. You'll find an up-to-date menu of both feminized and regular lines, along with photos and descriptions. That's HumboldtCSI.com. Welcome back. You are listening to Shaping Fire. I'm your host, Shango Lose, and our guest this week is aquaponic cannabis expert, Stephen Raisner. So, Steve, during the first set, we, we pretty much got a little bit of grip of what we were even talking about, right? Because there's a lot of misperceptions coming into aquaponics about what's even going on. And so, so now that we understand that we've got this split biome and we're getting to take advantage, as, advantage of both the, the magic of having a living microbe life rhizosphere of a living soil, but then also this added benefit of the the water food web um, th- that the the roots are extending down into that's what I where I want to emphasize or focus now because um, when I first heard you speak about the water food web at um, at uh, Joshua Rutherford and Leighton Morrison's uh, traveling regenerative cannabis series like my mind was blown man like I did not I, it, it had never even occurred to me that all the cool stuff that we were talking about in the soil biome could also be happening in water and and I just I just listened to you with my mouth agape be like surprised so so before I go into like my series of questions um why don't you just kind of like dive into your explanation of the soil food web and why um the inhabitants of a healthy i dare call it living water i don't know if that's the term but it, like who lives in the living water that's adding so much more value versus just using living soil so i guess the the quick and easy answer is we don't know no oh. one's doing any research on on which microbes are doing what in the aquatic environment because everyone's so focused on soil because of mass agriculture, there's there's next to no research being done on uh, freshwater aquatic microbes in relation to um, you know mineralization. So that's that's the quick answer. But um, so so how I like to explain it is so with our method we have the, we call it the dual root zone. So in your your upper half we have uh, soils, we have mycorrhizal fungi, we have uh, you know microarthropods, um, you know. Uh, all your different worms, all your different, you know, mites, all the different creatures that, you know, we're all familiar with in the, uh, the, the soil and they have their own key components. And I'm sure there's many different, um, uh, wise people that have shared a lot of that critical information on your show In the aquatic environment we have, we do have mycorrhizae and there are fungi, fungi and, and fungal, huh. uh, networks that will grow aquatically, but they're not that they're very minuscule in terms of the total population. Um, they're generally 5% or less of the total biomass in the aquatic environment, whereas um, we rely much more heavily on uh, bacteria and rotifer and protists and um, uh, uh, oh, what's the name of the other one? It begins with an A. They're like bacteria. Anyways, I'll think of it. But um, So you have all these different um, uh, aquatic microbes uh, that um, uh, – Oh man! For whatever reason, it's bugging me. I can't remember the name of it. I'll think of it. It'll but, it'll um, pop it'll pop up at some point inappropriately <laughs> down the line, and then just say it out loud. <laughs> archaea. Thank there you. you. Archaea. Uh, archaea. So you have all these different aquatic microbes, and we have a much more biodiverse uh, matrix. So imagine if like all of your air could, was a really good environment for microbes, and there are microbes that live in the air, but it's not quite the same as as the water. Um, in the water, we can have much, much, much higher microbial densities than you can in soil. And um, on average, an aquaponic dual root zone setup uh, has 167% more microbial biodiversity in the root system compared to the, even the most diverse living soils and, um, and uh, hydroponic systems. Uh, it's not even comparable. So, um, but even your most diverse soil, we're at 167% more microbes in the root system. Uh, about 70% of the microbes in an aquatic environment can also survive in terrestrial environments, which is why we need to do a lot of research on these because a lot of these, you know, we know that, for example, CBD almost across the board will express higher in aquaponics, all, all things be considered equal um, than in terrestrial uh, expression. Uh, we also know, given certain stimuli, that we can increase THCV expression significantly significantly past most soil uh, controls as well, all but two controls that we've done so far. So 
Uh, and that's mostly just having to do with cultivar difference. But there's all these different genes that are being activated and we know nothing about because we've never activated them in soil because there's aquatic uh, microbes or other stimuli through the aquatic environment that's stimulating them and triggering them. Uh, and we don't know that, you know, there could be terpenes or cannabinoids that are only found in aquaponics or there, you know, it could be a way to, you know, especially with some of the minor cannabinoids, it seems like, you know, we can pretty radically increase um, production of, of you know, certain cannabinoids compared to uh, our soil controls. So this is a wildly under-researched area with a lot of room for growth for folks who are getting into the scene and, and want to start doing research in something that's fresh and new to them. Oh, absolutely. And and I, what, what I, I guess one takeaway I want people to take from this is that, you know, think about, you know, you don't even have to do dual roots and aquaponics with your soil. Just think about how can I increase the microbial biodiversity in ways that are non-pathogenic and non um, you know, negative to the the rest of the microbiome. You know, don't go dumping a ton of trichoderma on your system. It's not going to work. Um, but, you know, if you had horrible pythium, that might make sense. You know, <laughs> it just depends. So, but, uh, so, so you and I were talking, like before we got on air, you and I were talking about, we both have backgrounds in aquariums. So I can, I can really hear the person out there going, I've got an aquarium. Like, like when we do water changes regularly, right? Where you've got to remove some of the water and you replace it with fresh for the good of the, for the good of the inhabitants of the aquarium. Um, you know, could somebody repu replicate this in their home grow just by simply taking a gallon or whatever, or a couple cups out of their aquarium and pouring it into their patient grow or whatever, or, or is that, or is, or is that overly simplified? Oh, no, you absolutely get benefit from that. I would not do that in flour, um, you know, especially late in the flour. I wouldn't do that because you don't want the nitrates from that. But um, you could absolutely, when you're doing your water change, take, take that dirty water, especially for veg or for, you know, a first week or two of flour. Absolutely, that would be great. Or even take your... Um, um, uh, when you do a water change, take the water, let it settle, pour off the clear water and use that just for regular waterings for your veg and stuff. And then take that thick, heavier stuff and throw an air stone in it and a little bit of a little bit more, um, you know, maybe only drain about halfway. Throw an air stone in it and mix it up like a really concentrated compost tea. Maybe throw a little bit of your favorite uh, microbial mix, um, you know, uh, recharge or mammoth pea or whoever it is that you, you like or even some of your own compost in inputs or whoever – Whoever it is, um, you know your your special blend or your secret mix. Um, throw the microbes in there, let it mineralize, and then put that back on the plants and let that unlock, you know, 80, 70, 80 percent more of the nutrients that are in that fish waste that are just locked up in a non-plant available form. Um, this can be a great way for organic people that have, you know, large aquariums or or even large ponds that have, you know, lots of muck and stuff in the filters. Use it. It's great plant food. You're seeing to mineralize it the way you would with compost tea. Oh man, I can't imagine um, how how uh, that I threw away just down the down the drain all of that fantastic malm that used to uh, gather at the bottom of the aquariums. You know that uh, all the all the fish waste and old plant matter and all that stuff on the bottom, which in those days um, was was filth, right? <laughs> that, that, that was bad stuff, and we would pull that out with the vacuum. And now I'm like, oh man, if I could just you know have all that stuff in my plants, that's got to be you know pure gold. So in the uh, so in the water web, uh, you know, since there's not mycelium networks like there are in uh, soil, w what plays the role of moving nutrients around that the mycelium does in the soil? Is it simple wa simply water flow? It's not only water flow, but you have a, just a much higher density of of uh, microorganisms. You have seed shrimp and um, lots more nematodes and all different types of amoebas and protists and rotifers and and all kinds of things that are just swimming around, moving you know, and transporting nutrients around at a much higher rate. You also have the fact that a lot you know there's a lot more nutrient capacity in in, in water period um, to hold a lot of these nutrients and and to dissolve a lot of these nutrients in a way that is quickly usable um, both by the microbes but also by the plants themselves. Um, so that you know it, it doesn't even have to be in that, you know, solid form either, you know, a lot of it's just in the aquatic environment. So uh, you've used the term flood and drain a couple times. Would you go ahead and break that out for folks who are new to it? 
Sure. So we have tables, um, generally 12 by four foot tables um, uh, in, in long rows and the, and the water comes up and it floods about the bottom five to six, depending on the, the type of setup, uh, inches of water. Uh, and then uh, it has a bell siphon, uh, which was actually first invented by Pythagoras. You can look it up, the Pythagorean cup or the greed cup. Um, which was designed to uh, spill out all the wine if you overfilled the wine cup of wine. Um, but um, and what it does is as the water comes up to the top, it, cre- it gets a vacuum at the very top of the bell, and that sucks in the air and allows the water to drain. And then once the water comes all the way down to the bottom of the bell, there's a couple of slits cut that break that. Um, and then what this allows us to do, uh, and then the, the water stops and then allows the, the it drains the bed completely and allows the bed to fill back up again. And what this allows us to do is run one pump and continuously fill 3,000 square feet of grow beds or even 6,000 square feet of grow beds off of a single pump. Um, you know, with one failure point, um, you know, I can put a redundancy pump in there. Uh, if that one goes down, it turns on the other one and it just makes it really simple to make sure nothing bad happens, um, even in the event of some kind of catastrophic failure. So what's happening is that um, uh, one or a couple times a day, this floods and, and as the water level rises, you're introducing all of these, all this uh, water, food, re- web, nutrition and microbes and various guys uh, into the, the root rhizosphere from the roots that are hanging down uh, below the pot. And then also some of that is getting sucked up into the soil as well. And so you're doing this feeding uh, in this way. How many times a day are you going to do this, this, um, this flood and drain? So the flood and drain um, is on a cycle and it floods depending on the size and dimensions of the bed, anywhere between seven and 18 minutes, uh, and it just drains and floods again and fills again continuously. So this is why um, having those roots, this is why they're not getting choked off of oxygen because it's they're never living 100% of the time in water. It's just the water comes up and touches them and gives them a feed and then it recedes and then it comes up again. So it, it creates this really nice analog rhythm. Absolutely. And most plants are given, as long as the dissolved oxygen level is high enough, uh, most plants are around the three to four uh, parts per million dissolved oxygen level. As long as you're above that, they'll, they'll do okay. Obviously, they'll do better if it's higher than that, but that's kind of the minimum. I know lettuce, you can get it as low as 2.2 parts per million, which is super low. Um, but most other plants really do want, um, uh, you know, to be significantly higher. You know, most of the time you're wanting for a five or above, you know, bar minimum. So, so in, in the soil food web, we use soil amendments to increase the soil viability. And, you know, in a perfect system we're talking about a, you know, something that is no till with, 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 with some aged soil that has mycelium networks already set up. But, but, you know, if, if, if somebody doesn't have a no till set up, they, they've, they've put together soil and they've added some soil amendments to increase soil viability. Are there healthy additives when you're working with the water food web as well and 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 those inputs can we wildcraft them like what are you doing to to develop the the healthy the healthy and uh, vibrancy of this water sure so uh we use things like dtpa iron uh for iron and that's iron and potassium and calcium kind of are our big problems because they either get exported by large amounts by the plant material or um, they are oxidized in the case of iron, you know, Fe2 gets converted into Fe3 uh, unless it has some kind of chelation around it. So um, those are kind of, I guess, our, our big problems. Um, and so uh, we manage usually handle the calcium and potassium through pH up. Our pH will gradually go down over time. Um, so we'll use potassium silicate and calcium carbonate um, to amend that, to, to fix that and add, you know, potassium, silica and calcium as well as some loose carbonates. Uh, there's a lot of really bad information around aquaponics that, uh, you know, you shouldn't have any carbonates. Um, you actually need to maintain at least 40 parts per million carbonates, um, ideally higher, uh, or you will, uh, actually cut your microbial replication in half. Mm-hmm. Uh, and as we all know for soil or aquatics, you know, you don't want to ever cut your microbial replication in half. So, um, you know, and that's one of the biggest problems you, I know we, before the show, we talked about it, you know, there's not, a, there's a lot of information on aquaponics, but a lot of it's just really bad. Yeah. And there's a lot of stuff that's just any, anyone with a scientific mind that reads it just can, can see that there's problems. And that's been one of the big reasons that it's held, held up the aquaponics uh, movement. is just the fact that you know, there's only a handful of people that really know what they're doing to begin with. 
Well, that brings us back to the drum that you beat every time I hear you talk, which is there's just not enough proper education in cannabis yet. You know, everybody needs to get more educated. The the growers, the breeders, the end consumers, and, you know, more and more people are getting into education, but that doesn't mean that the quality of the education is high. There's a lot of people just repeating myths, and our whole scene could do a lot better when it comes to education. Oh, absolutely. I, I know. I, I fact, I've actually spoken at three churches in Oklahoma where we had a pastor come in and want someone that can talk about it. And it's really funny to go into a place there. You know, who who would have thought that I'd be walking into a, a church in southern, you know, in Oklahoma to go talk about cannabis? Like, what happened? Wow. Like, what, what, <laughs> cha- like, what, you know, it just feels like one day all of a sudden everything's okay. And, you know, it's just to go from where we were you know, when we were in high school to where we are now, where, you know, I'm able to go in and speak into a church in Oklahoma. It's just some days you just got to sit back, even though we have a lot of struggles right now. I know, especially with, with some of the legal stuff and people trying to patent things and all this other mess that people get headaches. But, you know, sometimes it's nice just to sit back and go like, wow, like this is just crazy how much, how much, you know, different it is now that we even have churches that are taking, talking about it. So, well, and there's there's a certain amount of humor too in the fact that even though like you know the historical Jesus would not have been white, um, you know you're long hair hippie looking guy like you on the stage you probably did not look all that different from than the guy on the crucifix. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so moving right along from that before I dig myself a hole. Um, <laughs> so you know one of the things about um, aquaponics that it's like the, one of the main things everybody knows is that there's fish involved, right? And, and so let's talk about the, the fish themselves. Um, where in this system do the fish live and how do you choose what fish to have? Sure. So we generally uh, choose the fish based on the temperature of the system and then the marketability, marketability of the fish and then whether or not um, that particular region will allow us to get a <clears throat> sorry, a, a meat processing license. So in, in most states in the United States, in fact, all of them, um, you cannot have a cannabis facility and a meat processing license because the meat processing inspection license guys are all federal and federally um, answer to a federal board or whatever. So uh, they can't deal with anyone who deals with cannabis until the federal laws change. So you have to either have your fish processed by a third party company that has a meat processing or you have to sell it through the pet trade which can be a a more lucrative option so depending on again your particular climate and things like that oftentimes it's it's cheaper to and and more economical to do koi or some of the more larger exotic aquarium fish arowanas or uh, paku or some of the more exotic plecos um, it, you know, it makes a lot more sense financially to raise those uh, and, and flip them, you know, every 12 to 24 months than it does, you know, to sell meat fish. And so if, if you do choose the meat fish, I mean, the only one that I'm thinking of that, that people use are tilapia. But are there other meat fish that people are using in aquaponics? Absolutely. So um, for, for cannabis in particular, um, you know, channel catfish, uh, paku, uh, yellow perch. Um, uh, we've done I'm trying to think there, I know there's a few others, uh, bluegill, um, uh, and then, you know, you could do anything that's regionally appropriate. There was another group we did snakeheads over, um, for a vegetable grow over in India. Um, you know, and you can also do cold water, although you, you shouldn't do salmonids or, um, anything like that with cannabis in particular, because the potassium levels we have are fine for most fish, but, um, most fish that go from saltwater to freshwater, um, when they regulate that salt, the potassium seems to um, become a much bigger problem with tilapia being the one exception um, so that it tends to kill them pretty quickly uh, that uh, when they get into the, you know, the ranges we're in for cannabis. So um, them and white bass would be the one that we had some trouble with um, when we were doing our testing. So I would avoid those. So, so, you know, in a, when, when I see the illustrations online explaining a system, very often they will simplify it and they'll just have what looks like a fish tank below the table. But I imagine that that's not actually how it is because these tables are, are large and there's many of them. Is how it works in the real world that, that somewhere near the table set up in the warehouse or wherever it's going to be, there will be a you know several hundred gallon tank and it is filled with the fish and then you're simply piping the water over to the table? 
Yep, yep. So a lot of people think that the fish are actually living in the plant roots, which is not the case. They will happily eat the plant roots in most cases. It's a cool um, we, It's a cool thing to picture in your head though, right? The idea of the oh, fish yeah. swimming between the roots. That sounds cool, but yeah, you're right. Having them munch on the roots, that's not a win. You know what does work really well though? We talked a little bit this, about this in the past is those little colorful shrimp that you like a lot. Oh yeah, so, the Neocaridina um, heteropoda. Yeah, they, they work great in the to keep the root systems exfoli exfoliated and to keep the detritus and the algae out of there. They're they're awesome. But um, so, <laughs> uh, but yeah, so we actually have sump tanks. Uh, everything flows back to the sump tanks. Um, the beds pump up from the sump tanks and go uh, into the beds. Uh, the water goes into the beds and then back down where the uh, from where the plants are. And then we have a separate loop where we have the aquariums. Um, so water pumps up from the same sump over to the aquariums. It goes from the aquariums. Gravity feeds in through two sets of filters uh, and then goes back down into the ground. And then we can reroute that depending on where we want it to go. Um, generally, we'll keep a, a mixture of a couple of, you know, a bunch of different tanks so that when we're rotating fish out, if I have a bunch of fry, obviously, they're not going to produce a whole lot of fish waste so uh, we can balance that out with um you know another better or another fish tank or two so that we can maintain you know pretty even nutrient levels uh, regardless of our harvest cycle with the fish uh, so make, making sure you have you know extra fish tanks uh, and, and can work a rotation like that is is one thing they often see people don't don't do well on the larger commercial operations but um I know, and there's other stuff too. You know, people put UV sterilizers on them, which you shouldn't do. You know, it causes mineral issues with boron and and some other stuff. I mean, there's a lot of just goof or people that tell you you don't need fil filters or you know all kinds of goofy stuff out there. Um, so one thing I remember from when I was raising these shrimp, you know, I had like 35 aquariums and I would often share water between the aquarium. And then if one aquarium went south on it and got out of, uh, out of balance, I did not want to, uh, share that water in my other tanks because I didn't want the disease or imbalance, whatever the problem was to spread to my other tanks. Well, in this case, we're directly feeding from the aquarium into the flood and drain tank tables um how much hassle or or potential for disease transfer is there from an imbalance or disease in the aquarium to then be transferred to our plants so to date um there is no known uh plant pathogens that can go from a fish into a cannabis plant wow um there you can absolutely have Things like in theory, you could have E. coli or salmonella or some other things like that. But actually, the University of Hawaii did seven years of study um, where they were intentionally infecting infecting systems um, and, and had no you know tissue samples test positive in, in aquaponics, uh, and that includes you know intentionally introducing pathogens. Um, and University of Arizona, University of Wisconsin have also done pretty extensive food safety studies on that as well. Um, and then University of Kentucky State's actually done stuff on probiotic mitigation with that using lactobacillus. Uh, fermentation uh, microbes and then introducing those and, and using those actually to eliminate even non-pathogenic E. coli. Lots of uh, aquaponic systems will test hot for E. coli. Um, it's not an E. coli that's human pathogenic. You could drink the water, you won't get sick. It's just, it's a species of E. coli and it will give you a false positive. Um, so uh, you can absolutely use that even to eliminate those false positives as well. And um, uh, it's just a, it's a really good way to, to, to do something in a way that's not going to imbalance your whole system as well. Um, so there's lots of different solutions uh, depending on what you're doing. But uh, we actually, uh, on all the systems I designed, we can reroute any of the beds to any of the sumps and any of the fish tanks to any of the sumps. So even if we have, you know, sick fish, I can bring that fish tank offline and everything else will still operate just fine. You know, maybe you have to do a little bit more balancing with some of the flow rates, but it's not a big deal. Um, and this allows you to have that kind of control. If I have you know, somebody drops something and breaks a valve or goes to turn a valve and it snaps or these things happen. So you have to have that kind of ability to compartmentalize and shut down things. Or uh, maybe you have an earthquake and it breaks, you know, have part of the you know tree falls down and breaks part of the system, but the rest of it's okay. You need that be able to uh, isolate the system and, and keep as much production online at all times as possible. So we, we plan all that into the, the design and you know, that would be the one time we'd break out a UV sterilizer or an ozonator or something like that it would be just to put on an offline tank just to treat the fish that are in there because, you know, we generally don't want to use anything that we have to, you know, we'll treat them with lactobacillus. Uh, we'll give them, if there's a, 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 a cattle medication you can use as a last resort called Prohibit. That is actually um, uh, for aquaculture that can be used for fish for human consumption later on. I believe it's a 90-day cool-down time. 
uh, or 100 or 180 days if you're in Canada. So, so you know, hearing you describe that, um, I'm imagining a whole lot of plumbing. And, um, you know, with, with regular soil cannabis, I mean, pretty much you, you can take a flower pot, throw soil in it, put your seed in it, water that baby, and you'll have a plant of, of some degree of success, right? And then, and then from that point on, as you learn more, uh, you can make your plants better and better. Um, aquaponics though, like you need to have a certain depth in what you're doing just to plan and strategize and build one of these in advance. Um, I would think that, you know, especially in the idea of measure twice, cut once, like the, the install is probably by far the biggest hassle of the whole aquaponics process. Oh yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. The, the, I do a lot of design work for different companies and, and design farms. That's mainly what I do these days is design them or, or help people that have already built them that, that need help with their SOPs. Um, but, um, uh, uh, but absolutely, yeah, the, it's a lot of plumbing. And if you don't know what you're doing um, or design it wrong, I know there's a company out there right now. It's one of the bigger aquaponics companies that, that has a, a cannabis-specific system that has given me a lot of business, <laughs> uh, which I'm thankful for. <laughs> right on. They, they they get the the out of the box. So they get the the boxed solution, and they're like, "Uh oh, we need we need better than the box." Yep. Yeah. So since we're talking about a lactobacillus acid serum, um, I I told you, and since it's trending so much, I gotta ask: Is there are there KNF Korean Natural Farming applications for aquaponics? Absolutely. Yeah, we actually will use IMO one uh, liquid IMO. Um, uh, we don't use FFA. Um, we don't use, um, IMO three, just too much sugar. Um, you know, and, uh, uh, stuff like that, you know, would, wouldn't make sense, but you know, anything that would make sense within an aquatic environment is it works perfectly well. Um, you know, we'll use OHN, um, you know, all those things are perfectly fine to use in your aquaponic system. In fact, you know, what's interesting with OHN and people talk about uh, alcohol dosing. So you have acetobacter bacteria, that live in your soil and acetobacters love to feed on nitrogen. So you can actually use, uh, like in a reef tank and I don't, I, I don't know how much you remember this from aquariums, but in, in aquariums, you can actually do something called vodka dosing where you can dose with vodka to feed the acetobacters to break down the nitrogen and make it non-lethal to the, the fish and bind it up. So you can actually do very similar dosing, um, with soil or aquatics, um, for plants as well and terrestrial, it's not quite as extreme as it does in an aquarium, but it'll still give you a reduction in nitrogen so that you're not ending up with too much end coming into flower. So when I was at the regenerative cannabis conference that you were speaking at uh, back in Michigan this summer, uh, Elaine Ingham said, uh, you know, she pointed out the importance of of having real sunshine hitting the soil of our plants because, you know, the, the sunshine hitting the plant, of course, is going to give us the widest terpene profiles and let the plant express itself most naturally. But then also how the this the sunshine hitting the soil around the base of the plant was having all this interaction with the soil microbes directly and the, the warming of the soil and like you know all this analog magic that was was happening when the sunshine hits the soil now people will will fake the sun with lights indoor but those lights don't fake out the soil and so there's a certain amount of microbe activity loss because it's not you know um, authentic sunshine how does that cross apply over to aquaponics is it is it um, very easy to do an aquaponics setup under artificial lights or are you needing to do this under uh, glass roofs or in greenhouses or something like that uh, we've had equal success both in aqua and indoor and with um, greenhouses um, I personally I think anyone who's not doing greenhouses at this point is wasting money on cultivation because you're not going to be around you know the, when the price comes down yeah. ultimately there's just you're you shouldn't be investing in indoor at this point unless you're doing breeding or really specific cultivars or something like that where it really makes sense otherwise for commercial production you're just you're going to get priced out the market pretty quick yeah so last question before we go to commercial like you know, I'm a big fan of polyculture and companion planting, and we talk about it a lot on the show. Um, are there opportunities for doing companion planting in aquaponics? 
Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I'm a big fan of companion planting as well. Um, we're big on purslane, watercress, um, uh, thyme, uh, majorum, um, uh, creeping lavender, creeping rosemary. Um, we've got all different types of stuff uh, in our aquaponic systems. We find that, um, you know, it really helps with, um, you know, just ha- healthier root systems in general. Do you find that it's helping both the, the you know, the, we know about polyculture and how it's good for the soil and good for the plants and the, and the, and the rhizospheres talk to each other, all that good stuff. Do we find that um, companion planting helps with the, the thriving of the, of the water as well or keeping it balanced or are there advantages to companion planting to the, to the living water? Um, you can definitely, um, especially when you're coming into flower, if you plant them, you know, about second half of veg so that they're really starting to take off when you're coming into flower, it can really help reduce the nitrogen levels in the system, especially mm-hmm. locally around the plant, which can be really beneficial for flower. Um, uh, and that's probably, I guess, the biggest benefit from them. Um, we also love to do a chamomile, which is another one just because it's such a, a bug magnet. Right on. That's totally cool. All right, let's go ahead and take our second short break and be right back. You're listening to Shaping Fire. My guest today is aquaponic cannabis expert, Steve Raisner. Cultivators who grow in living soil are very particular on what inputs they use in their soil. They educate themselves and painstakingly create compost and nutritive teas to create thriving soils that will produce the very best expression of the cannabis plant. Many living soil farmers now believe that, over time, seeds become acclimated to the kind of substrate they are grown in. For example, a seed that was bred in synthetic fertilizers may not immediately know what to do in a living soil environment, slowing their growth and decreasing yield. The Regenerative Seed Cooperative is a different kind of seed bank. The Regenerative Seed Cooperative only provide cannabis seeds that were bred in living soil and using probiotic growing techniques. That way, when you germinate in soil, the seed's genetics will recognize the environment and immediately start interacting with microbes and fungal networks. These seeds are described as bio-intelligent. The number of cannabis breeders participating in the Regenerative Seed Cooperative is rapidly increasing. Already signed on are Bamboos, Stock and Bean, Pacific Northwest Roots, LOS Gardens, Dragonfly Earth Medicine, ITAL Foundation, Bob Hemphill's Cricket and Cicada, Dutch Blooms, Heart Rock Mountain Farms Pride of Lion, Sebring Seeds, and Mount Baker Highway, with more being added every month. These seeds are regulars, autoflowers, and hemp varieties. A significant amount of the profits go to cannabis seed preservation projects available to everyone. Do you want to take every advantage that you can when growing in beautiful, healthy soil? Then consider buying your seeds from the Regenerative Seed Cooperative at regenerativeseeds.com. That's regenerativeseeds.com. Growing cannabis in greenhouses is taking over the cannabis industry. An efficient and effective blend of sunshine-grown terpene profiles and the controlled environment of indoor, greenhouses can be the best of both worlds. For many greenhouse operators, though, building their greenhouse before gaining insight into how cannabis greenhouses differ from ornamental crops can be the start of a world of hurt. Eric Brandstad and his team at Greenhouse Advisory Group have the experience and technical know-how to help you avoid these pitfalls. Eric Brandstad has been helping cannabis growers find locations, design, build, and equip their greenhouses for over a decade, first starting in Northern California, but expanding over the last five years to helping clients throughout the world. He has an impeccable reputation for both depth of knowledge and kindness in communication. You can hear Eric explain some of the challenges facing cannabis greenhouses and how to overcome them in episode number 41 of the Shaping Fire podcast. No matter where I go in the country, good people with smart backgrounds still are making the mistake of building without knowing cannabis, and it causes them to burn through capital and time fast. Everyone has their own failure point. For some, it is improper ventilation planning. For others, it is surface temperatures of the building or the plant's leaves or both. Some folks that build their greenhouse from scratch make really basic errors like placement of the greenhouse on the property or not understanding the natural environment where the greenhouse sits. Some have even built a decent greenhouse but are inefficient in their deployment of light deprivation techniques and never really hit their target yields. It's great when you learn from your mistakes, but it's even better when you learn from the mistakes of others. 
When you bring on Greenhouse Advisory Group, you will learn from the mistakes of their many clients, and you'll take advantage of the best practices developed by Eric Brandstad over his years of working with clients just like you. From location development to choosing a builder and tricking out your new greenhouse or retrofitting or rescuing your failing greenhouse, Eric will help you through it. Visit GreenhouseAdvisoryGroup.com to learn more and connect with Eric and his team. That's Greenhouse Advisory Group. Welcome back. You're listening to Shaping Fire, and I'm your host, Shango Los. And our guest this week is aquaponic cannabis expert, Steve Raisner. So uh, during the first two sets, we figured out what the hell aquaponics are. And during the second set, we really got into what's going on on the science and biological levels. Well, here on the third set, we're going to talk about what happens when things go wrong. And, uh, you know, Steve, from the from the first two sets, it seems to me that the, the biggest problem is when things get out of balance, because just like the soil food web, um, when one input category or chemical category or microbe category when one of them gets you know too overabundant or 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 too lacking um it it really messes with the different the different layers of magnitude the different trophic layers of life and then the whole thing just kind of starts to crash i'm assuming that this is what happens as well in aquaponics Absolutely. And we use a combination of, um, you know, organic mineral salts as well as um, working more towards fermented um, uh, inputs as well. A big shout out to, to Patrick from Soil King. He has that amazing Excel sheet over on his website of all the different mineral inputs um, and different uh, plants that you can mineralize through compost teas or ferments. Um, to, to extract that and we're doing a lot of testing on that now in a couple of different facilities that we're working with to try and replace even some of those minerals that we're using but we use a lot of you know um, potassium silicate and calcium carbonate for pH up you know, DTPA for iron um, and then you know other other um, you know sulfates and some other stuff for for uh, you know organically certified of course um, when possible um, uh, to address some of these issues, but uh, for the most part, again, we're getting 85 to 90 percent of them with the aquaponics, and just doing very minor changes um, uh, or unlocking them through other means, like we talked about with the ferments or teas, the way that everyone uh, you know is, is traditionally familiar with, uh, and doing a hybrid of those two really is the the solution for those. And uh, one of the big ways that I guess maybe we're different is that we're testing our nutrients in the aquatic environment every two weeks at most of our facilities that I'm working with. Um, some people are down to every four weeks just because it's is down pat with the cultivars that they're running but uh, most people are again every two weeks they're sending out their water just to find out hey what's going on and um, you know where are we at with with micronutrients and we're just making really tiny mineral adjustments so that you know even when we are dosing with something it's it's you know three three ppms or five ppms difference something real small um, just to keep it in range and to keep everything rocking because again the fish waste is providing the vast majority of what we need we're just amending the the little bit that we can not either put through the fish or stuff that would be oxidized or you know, otherwise it would be harmful if it went through the digestive tract of the fish. So in my experience, aquariums go bad quickly. Now, granted, um, you know, my aquariums, uh, you know, I probably had 35, 40 gallon breeder aquariums. So 40 gallons is, is not a lot of, um, water mass, if you will, total volume, um, to buffer itself. So, so if something got out of whack, it really got out of whack quickly. Um, so I got a two part question for you. Number one, um, what is the normal range for the size of these aquariums? Uh, even if you have multiples of them that you're, you're pulling your water from and does the amount of water plus the fact that it's filtering, uh, to a certain degree through some amount of soil, does that all just kind of like buffer it all and, and make it way less likely that things are going to go bad um, really quickly? Because like every other, you know, testing every other week doesn't sound often enough. Uh, so um, the, uh, there's, there's kind of two, two parts to that. So one, um, the main systems that I see people growing cannabis in is, um, you know, two IBC systems, which is around 400 gallons of water uh, for the home grower. And that's kind of the normal size, I guess, that I see the most. Uh, it's just two of those IBC-style aquaponic systems that there's lots of public information on and how to build. 
Um, and then for the commercial systems, I'm mostly seeing stuff that's in the 30, 20,000 gallon to 30,000 gallons uh, size systems, uh, oftentimes split into either five to 10,000 gallon sections um, that are that are loops on their own that can all be either cross plumbed or separated into individual systems depending on you know the needs and desires of the the system operator at the time. Um, but that I guess probably isn't the 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 two the two I guess layouts. Um, I know most of the systems that I'm designing are right around 10,000 gallons, between eight and 10,000 gallons per loop, which is a sump tanks, fish tanks, and filtration and grow beds, mm -hmm. um, and that generally provides a, a you know a 3,000 square foot bay. Um, sometimes we'll get maybe a 4,000 square foot bay again, depending on the greenhouse dimensions. And so uh, this this sheer size just slows down um, the speed at which any Im imbalance can proliferate. Oh, absolutely. So the in an aquarium, what happens is is that you have a high you have nitrogen, the ammonia and and fish waste build up and cause it gets converted by microbes into nitrates and nitrates uh, get higher and higher and higher and then they can dissolve down. Um, or they end up dissolving the alkalinity or dissolved carbonate hardness, which then when that gets super low causes an instability in pH uh, and then the pH crashes, which um, in, a, in a very large volume of water, um, it, it becomes almost impossible to do that without having to go to pretty big extremes. I mean, it's absolutely possible, but you have to really strip the water down or use RO water from the beginning or or something else that has no stability to it. But a healthy system will have carbonates, especially if you're dosing um, with the right nutrients. Um, you know, if you end up low in carbonates, you can always dose with potassium bicarbonate. Again, you, you can get that OMRI certifiable. Um, and uh, and then you're adding, uh, you know, two carbonates and one potassium um, for, for everything, uh, for every dose. I was thinking about you know the 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 likelihood of the 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 aquariums to go south on me, and then it occurred to me that that really um, the even though the aquarium and the fish are there to serve the cannabis grow, um, what essentially the cannabis grow is is a big badass filter for the aquariums and makes it way, way less likely than, you know, a traditional aquarium to go south on you just because you have this elaborate living filter. Absolutely. The the biggest pitfalls, I guess, the short to go back to what your original question was, is, is pH and temperature. Um, if you're maintaining your pH and you're maintaining your temperature, either through heaters or, or chillers or a combination thereof, depending on your climate, um, it's going to be pretty hard to have a, an outbreak short of someone dosing something into the system that shouldn't be in there or loose electrical current or um, your neighbor oversprays with glyphosate. I've seen that happen in a commercial <laughs> oh, facility. Man. Yeah, it turns the – if anyone's curious, an aquaponics glyphosate will turn the plants ivory from the top down. They, they go from green to ivory in about two days. Wow, that sounds really interesting. I think I need to pull up a picture of that online to check that out. Um, so so uh, one more question here but before we move on to this new interesting project that you're working on. So, you know, when we're talking about soil, there are ways that the soil can um, – uh, no longer allow us to tend to it. And and what I mean specifically is we can get a compaction layer, right, that becomes hydrophobic and we go to water and the water just, um, you know, goes off the, the side of the top of the pot and down the sides and right out the holes in the bottom. And so we are drying out our pot because the top layer is hydrophobic. Um, similarly, somebody's pH could get all screwed up and, and we'll get what people generally call nutrient lockout. And so so these are these are both ways where we're trying to do our best for the plants, but the the ecosystem is saying, uh, uh we're too far down this path. Um, is there anything like that in hydroponics? Is there a way that the system can can try to lock you out from making your changes? Absolutely. So I, I would say the the biggest similarity with that would be if you don't have adequate filtration, you can end up with sludge build up in your sumps and your grow beds. And that can absolutely lock up nutrients and things like that. And one of the ways we mitigate that 
uh, is again through healthy microbes, lactobacillus and other compost tea amendments, but uh, into your beds occasionally. But also with um, one of my favorite uh, creatures we have in the system, which are black worms, which if you're an aquarium person, I'm sure you'd remember um, those little tiny black worms you get at the pet store to live feed your tropical fish. Well, when you put them in your uh, aquaponic system, they love to feed on the bacteria and things like that that go in those little, little um, anaerobic pockets. So they'll actually go out and seek that out and tunnel through them and bring oxygenated water into those and break them up and actually seek out those areas like little, um, you know, anaerobic heat uh, seeking missiles uh, that go and, and, and uh, break up those areas. So uh, I actually put them in all the aquaponic beds and they're one of this, I guess, secret weapons, I guess, that I would use, uh, say, um, that we use to eliminate sludge because they do such a good job and they'll kind of maintain their population based on the amount of sludge in there. And if they end up blowing through and they have some baby fish, they're great fish food too. So, um, <laughs> you know, they're, they're, they don't really hurt anything. Um, and uh, they're just a, a great way to clean it along with your red wigglers and your earthworms that you would have in your grow beds. You kind of have three different sizes. Uh, and they can break up all that waste and, and keep everything nice and flowing. And, and again, to keep the biologicals going, as long as the dissolved oxygen is high enough, even those worms don't care about being submerged. Right on, right on. So let's finish up talking about these uh, cool projects you've got going on. Like you're, you have a unique uh, situation because since you design and design build aquaponics for folks, you essentially go to where the work is. It's not like you have set up where, you know, where you live and then, um, you know, you set up your grow and then you kind of like stay put. You are a traveling guy. And so uh, from what I understand right now, you're in Oklahoma, but then, you know, you've got some great news that you're going to share with us yet. You haven't talked about Publicly. So, so why don't you tell us just like uh, what you're doing in Oklahoma and then a little bit about this uh, project before we wrap up. Sure. So uh, I'm out here in Oklahoma. Uh, there's a couple of different aquaponic producers out here that I've been helping do both design work and, and SOP work and some troubleshooting work for some guys that got started a little bit before I came out here and uh, really do it, you know, helping get them on, on back on track and kind of helping uh, the guys out here get used to the, the normal regulated market that we've all grown to love in Oregon and California and Washington and, you know, who doesn't love hours of paperwork? <laughs> um, so, um, uh, you know, and just crossing your I's and dotting your T's and, and you know, doing that whole thing. But um, uh, depending on when this episode airs, you'll be the first place this gets announced um, is uh, I, we're going to be, I'm going to be part of a company. Um, I'm going to leave out the other people that are on it just because I don't know when this is launching because of that part can't be out before the press release, but I, I got permission to say the rest of this. Um, but we have a company called Agilion, and we were going to have one of the, as far as I'm aware, one of the largest, uh, we currently have one of the largest licenses on the planet. Um, we have, um, in terms of how many thousands of hectares it is. Um, but we're going to begin uh, starting in uh, about three or four weeks. I don't know what the, yeah, about four weeks from now, uh, we'll begin planting uh, in South Africa. Uh, we have a 147,000 square foot facility we're going to be building out as phase one uh, and then rolling into thousands and thousands of hectares once our, that facility is basically going to function as a nursery um, for, for our thousands of hectares uh, that we're going to be producing out of South Africa. Um, which is going to be a lot of fun. Um, it's a lot of fun working on a project that's this scale and working with some of the amazing people that are on our team. We have people that, um, that you've had on your show before that are part of our team. And uh, it's it's really going to be awesome to kind of do something that's not only large scale, but, you know, regeneratively minded and sustainably minded, but also, you know, gives back to the local community as well. Um, we'll be looking, uh, working hand in hand with local farmers and making sure that um, a lot of the local farmers as well are getting, you know, a large percentage of the profits back into the country and that it's not just getting exported out of there like a, a normal situation. So we'll have a lot more details coming on, uh, out on that one in the press release along with the groups that we're working with and some of the other big names that are part of the project. But um, I'm super stoked on that and we'll be once uh, the construction is done in the nursery, as far as I'm aware, we'll have the larger, largest aquaponics facility on the planet. Wow, um, that, that's some cool that. bragging rights right there. <laughs> and that it's going to be cannabis. That's awesome. Yep. Um, you know, uh, what, if you would, hit on the, the equity aspect of it. Because you were telling me about that a little bit earlier. And, and I still think that cannabis equity is, is new to a lot sure. of folks. And I think that's a really interesting aspect of your project. Sure. So we have a, a couple of different licenses that we have under that, but um, uh, part of those licenses are, are um, uh, half owned by the um, uh, uh, 
uh, African Farmers Association over there uh, in South. I'm sure I'm mispronouncing the actual name of the group. Um, again, I don't have the, the paper in front of me at the moment, but um, uh, we'll, we're going to be donating it to them, which is going to be awesome. Uh, so uh, they own half the license and we'll be working hand in hand with their farmers to get best practices as well as um you know uh, uh, a way for them to export it back out of there um, we're also working with a track and trace uh program that we've developed that's going to be part of our our system for that so allow farmers to um, get paid directly as well um uh from people and even allow people to to pay ahead of time for those uh, runs, you know, if you have a farmer and he's really skilled and you have someone uh, overseas that wants to put money down on their next run because they thought the last one was bomb and was really good, this allows people to do that and, and allow these farmers access to money that would be totally off limits or or it would be filtered out by the guys at the docks or the ports or all the other 10,000 ways that these guys get ripped off that we all know about um, and a half of us have had done to ourselves. Um, so it's going to kind of streamline all of that and move the banking directly into that kind of system and, and remove a lot of the potential for the middlemen and just work out solid contracts for transport and simplify and get rid of a lot of the, the riffraff and, and a lot of stuff that both scares away investors, but also really screws over the farmers that are actually the dudes that are growing the weed that have the skills and the knowledge to, to give us the medicine that we want in the first place. And we all know how much those guys get screwed in these far. I mean, anyone that's been to Jamaica or any of these other places knows how badly those guys get screwed over and um and robbed in a lot of cases as well so this is going to help uh really break through a lot of that um and, and get a, a it's going to be really awesome so we'll have a facility both in cape town and then over in east london um for phase one and then we have a, a roll out into a couple of other areas uh, into phase two how exciting that's going to be my you know two things come to mind right away is that number one just the the cool cultural aspects of being in south africa and the beauty and the different insects and the cool trees and the different sunsets and and the different smells and like just being somewhere exotic that's going to be really cool but also to be living there for a while and to get your hands on all these like varieties of african land races that you're going to have your hands on because you're going to be meeting cool people who live there that are also cannabis folks. I mean, my God, dude, you've got to be so excited. Oh, dude, I'm super stoked. And I'm even more stoked because the, the cultivars that have been doing the best in Oklahoma actually have been the Malawi, the Swazi, and the Durban crosses that we have. So it's been funny that like I've been growing those pretty much all summer, and, uh, and now I'm going to be going and growing them again um, in a couple of weeks here. We, we're going to begin planting November 1st, but we got to do a little bit of setup and training with the guys. Um, what, one interesting thing is when you go to these more uh, – uh, far-flung places is a lot of times you have to redo all of your education material into IKEA directions <laughs> because a lot of these guys uh, don't they know a little bit of English on, on reading and writing but they don't know a lot of reading and writing so you have to basically redo all of your manuals and instructions and SOPs into something with pictures because or video otherwise you can't just rely on that to be forever like a, a resource. So um, that's definitely a challenge that I've found, especially working in Jamaica. I ended up going back home for a couple of weeks and coming back with my whole DVD collection, you know, a bunch of the Jorge Cervantes DVDs and the <laughs> Mr. Mr. Green Thumb and the, uh, uh, all the old go ones and uh, the VH, some VHSs. And I gave them out. I was like, here, watch all these. Uh, because frankly, they did, you know, it's the easiest way to try and, you know, wrap their heads around some of the concepts that otherwise can be quite difficult to, to, to explain without having visualizing, you know, without visualizing it. And that's been another challenge I found, you know, both in South Africa and working with some of the guys down there, but also in, in Jamaica. And again, it's not like poo pooing them for, for not knowing that. It's just a, a challenge that comes with the industry, especially with farmers that have been, you know, hey, if you're a really good farmer, and you're crushing it and you're doing well on food production, well, you don't really need to learn to read, you know, at any point as if you were trained well. I mean, you obviously you do for self-growth, but I mean, if as, as a point of reliance, you can get by in a lot of parts of the world, you know, just fine. Yeah, I understand that. Right on, dude. Well, um, Steve, thank you so much for taking your time to share all this with us. And I got to tell you, you know, it's it's very exciting to find out that, you know, this thing that I love, this this soil food web and that I've been studying, that, that now there is an equally sized, if not deeper and more unstudied rabbit hole to go down in this water food web. And, uh, and it's just fantastic that you, uh, you know, helped us open this door up for a lot more people. So thanks so much for sharing your expertise.
Absolutely. Thanks for thanks for having me on. And yeah, if, if anyone's a, a college kid looking for a way to make a mark for yourself or a way to develop products, get into the aquatic mineralization stuff. There's there's probably billions of dollars of, of microbial products in there, you know, uh, uh, worth of research. You know, it's, it's a wide open field and something you can definitely do well for yourself in. And um, I think, uh, do you mind if I mention the podcast too? Or? No, no, go ahead. I was going to plug it, but you go ahead and plug okay. it yourself. Yeah. Sure. Um, so, uh, so I also have the uh, Growing With Fishes podcast um, is inspired by people such as yourself that uh, go out there and put out a uh, hardcore education on, on and try to get you know the realm away from the Cheech and Chong and more into academia and more into science. Um, as much as we love the old old ways, uh, doesn't really help us get taken as seriously by the agricultural field and, and advance us in, in, you know in, in the sciences. So it's really awesome to have you know more science oriented uh, podcasts and um, we, we have a podcast every week um, uh, on um, Tuesdays and Thursdays at 6.30 p.m. And we have a guest from all over. In fact, Shango was just on it not too long ago. And uh, you can check out his interview on there as well. And, um, uh, yeah, we just try to put out education every week uh, that's circused around regenerative soil and, and aquaponics. So if you want to hear more from aquaponic canvas expert Steve Raisner, and you know you do, um, you can check out the Growing With Fishes podcast that's going to be on your favorite podcasting app. Um, you can also check out his incredible YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash potent ponics. And uh, there you will find instructional videos from Steve as well as videos of the uh, Growing With Fishes podcast as a video, uh, including hangouts with a whole cast of interesting characters. And uh, if you're really into uh, the education aspect and you want to find out more about Steve Raisner's education classes, you can go to his website at a pmjclass.com and you can find out about upcoming uh, classes there. You can find more episodes of the Shaping Fire podcast and subscribe to the show at shapingfire.com and on Apple iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play. If you enjoyed the show, we'd really appreciate it if you'd leave a positive review of the podcast wherever you download. Your review will help others find the show so they can enjoy it too. On the Shaping Fire website, you can also subscribe to the weekly newsletter for insights into the latest cannabis news and product reviews. On the Shaping Fire website, you will also find transcripts of today's podcast as well. For information on me and where I'll be speaking, you can check out shangolose.com. Does your company want to reach our national audience of cannabis enthusiasts? Email hotspot at shapingfire.com to find out how. Thanks for listening to Shaping Fire. I've been your host, Shango Lose.